following in the footsteps of the Sojourner Spirit and Opportunity rovers, the Mars Science Laboratory aboard the Curiosity rover was launched from Cape Canaveral in November of 2011 and deployed after a precise seven minutes of descent maneuvers to the surface of Mars in August of 2012. The six-wheeled rover of size and weight measurements comparable to a pickup truck is powered by a plutonium-238 isotope that provides power for heat generation to the electrical demands of the onboard systems. The Curiosity mission seeks to find evidence of organic molecules that would indicate possible life on the surface, to locate biomarkers that would provide new clues about the atmospheric history of the planet, to drill into and analyze the geology of rocks, and to determine the sources and levels of hazardous radiation at the surface. The collected data and lessons learned from the Curiosity mission should be useful in paving the way for future robotic and manned missions to our red planetary neighbor. And now, from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, please welcome Andrea Jones. to be here. I had a great time at one of the Northern Virginia Astronomy Club's events in the fall and apparently you thought I was okay there and wanted to hear me again, so thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, yes, my name is Andrea Jones and I am an Education and Public Outreach Specialist at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, my company is LPI, the Lunar and Planetary Institute, but I get to work in Greenbelt, Maryland. Um, and it's a lot of fun. One of my jobs is to uh, do education and public outreach for planetary missions, and Curiosity is one of those missions. And it is a lot of fun. I've got to tell you, my background is in planetary geology, and um, I loved learning about it, but I love even more telling people about it. So as an education and public outreach specialist, I get to go to all the science meetings and be involved with what's going on right now. But Instead of doing the research myself, I just get to hear about it and then come to things like events like this. And I get to go to Dead Valley and talk about Mars analogs and things like that. So it's, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> um, I see that we have a mixed group here tonight. And so I just wanted to find out a little bit where we stand in the audience before I get started. And how many people are really familiar with Curiosity? You've been following it since before it launched. You are up on all the events. All right, so they're going to come on up here and, and give this talk after me. <laughs> How many people have heard about it but don't really know a whole lot about the mission? Okay, how many people are somewhere in between? Okay, so I am going to try to keep that in mind as I move forward, but if I am not getting to a level that you would like me to talk about, uh, please do ask questions and I can try to either explain in more detail or less detail, uh, however you'd like. So, so do stop me whenever you have a question, um, and I'd be happy to, to hear what you've got to say. And if you've got something else to add, please also let me know, because I know there are a lot of experts in this room. All right. So let's get started here. Um, and I think, ah, here we go. So Curiosity. Curiosity is the biggest and baddest rover ever to go <laughs> to another planet. I say that often, but I think it's so true. I think it's amazing. The capabilities that this rover brought with it are just phenomenal. Um, the instrument that I work with and that I will be talking most about, um, or maybe not most about, but that I am most familiar with is called SAM, the Sample Analysis at Mars. And that's an instrument suite that is about the size of a microwave oven, and yet if it were on Earth, it would take up the size of a trailer, about a mobile home type size. And that's just one instrument of 10 on board this rover. So it can do all kinds of things that <coughs> no other rover has ever been able to do. And as we heard before, yeah, it's about the size of a car, about the size of a Mini Cooper. It's about 2,000 pounds on Earth, and it's about um, so that's about five times bigger than the Mer rovers, than Spirit and Opportunity. So this is a big guy. He's really capable. Um, and, and it's got some really, really high, exciting goals. So what it's trying to do is look for habitable environments on Mars. So what we mean by habitable is a place that has the stuff that life likes. We are not actually looking for life. We tried that with Viking, didn't go so well, so we are trying a new tactic and we are just saying, hey, are the building blocks there that we need for life as we know it? Of course, we're not so good at looking 
looking for life as we don't know it. We haven't figured that part out yet. But um, we are looking for things that life does like. Um, so that's the biological potential of the environment, is all those things that life needs, are they there? And then we want to understand if we find these habitable environments, if we find these places that could maybe support life, either sometime in the past or in the present, um, what's the geology like? We want some context here. We want to understand what the rocks are like. What are the minerals in the area? What was the environment that supported um, this potential life at some point? So we want to know all about that. We want to know what water played in this environment? What role did it have? What did it do? How was it there? What kind of context? Because of course, as we know, life uh, requires water. But curiosity is past the follow the water mantra. Curiosity is on follow the carbon. We've gotten to see water. Water is on Mars. We've smelled it. We've tasted it. We've uh, chemically proven that it's there. Now we're moving on to carbon and looking at the isotopes and the ratios and all of those things um, to better understand the life part. And then we want to know the surface radiation. What is it like on the surface of Mars? We actually started this experiment um, on our way to Mars to find out what the radiation environment is like on our way to Mars. In case we send people there at some point, we want to know. What's going to happen to you when you go there? Are you going to be fried? Are you going to maybe be goo by the time you arrive? And if you are, we want to know that so that we can prepare um, and make sure we can uh, not have little puddles arrive at Mars. We want people who can be healthy and happy. And we also want our electronics to be OK. So these are important questions. We want to know what has been on the surface and what damage may have been done to those molecules by radiation. Um, so, so I can go more into that, but I think that's a good good start right here. Um, and along with our, our biggest, baddest rover, we have some cool capabilities. So we are a rover, meaning we can go places, we can move around, we can drive around, and we have a a new type of power source that most rovers do not have. Um, and it is it is a nuclear power source. It is not a reactor on board, but it does uh, have a nuclear source of energy that is decaying and providing us with our electricity, our heat. And that is allowing us to operate both during the day and at night. Yay for nighttime operations. That's twice the amount of stuff that we can do. We don't have to wait for the sun. We don't have to take a break in the winter. We can go all the time and potentially longer and do more exciting, more complicated, more power hungry experiments um, that you can't do with just solar panels. So this is very cool. We have lots of and lots of instruments, as I said, lots of cameras. Um, we have the ability to do lots of things that a field geologist can do and a robotic um, Geologist part. Yeah, well, okay. Robotic field geologist. We've got all those things. Um, all right. So lots of lots of uh, things that we can do. And here is the package of science instruments that we've got on board. I am not going to go over all of them in detail, but I will say that this is a collaborative effort. Hundreds of people, actually thousands of people have been involved in this mission from all over the world. Uh, with SAM, the instrument I work with most, we have a component from France on board. One of the instrument uh, pieces is from France. We have other uh, components from Russia. We have other components from Canada. And we have just lots and lots and lots of scientists and engineers and and everybody else involved in this mission. So it's a really amazing thing. And of course, we have to show off ChemCam, um, which is the laser, which in this image you can see, although it is infrared, so you cannot see it um, if you were actually going to Mars and taking a look, but it has um, been one of the cooler instruments on board, in my opinion. And um, actually, that's something else just to mention, that this is the first time we have an instrument like ChemCam, where it can shoot a laser up to about 20 feet away and test what it's looking at. What are the rocks made of 20 feet away? And if they're interesting, we can drive up and check them out. And if they're not, we don't have to waste our time driving over and, and finding out more information about a similar rock to what we've already seen. And this has been so successful, it's um, shot, been shot over 20,000 times in just um, the past few months. And 
we're going to do it again. So I hear from the science team, um, they want to send other rovers with similar capabilities. Um, as I had mentioned, SAM is the instrument I work with the most, and it was built at NASA Goddard. So this was built and tested and integrated right down the road, um, and it is in my opinion, the coolest instrument on board because it's looking for those organic molecules. So the real meat of the science that Curiosity is doing, in my very biased opinion, is being done by SAM. And SAM is getting some of its first samples. Um, it just got them, and we can talk about that more later. But press conference on Tuesday, folks. Mark your calendars to talk about some of the results um, that SAM has been getting. All right. So I wanted to make sure that you did see the family picture, um, in case not all of you have seen this yet. But Curiosity is a lot bigger than all the other guys who have gone to Mars. So we have Pathfinder in the middle from 96. And then 2006 brought the Mer rover Spirit and Opportunity. And then, oh, there we go. And then Curiosity, of course, the big, the big guy. And because it's so big, that was what inspired a new type of landing. So. Hopefully, many of you have heard of that. I'll, I'll briefly go over it. But this is where it went. Gale Crater. So Gale Crater, and I, I do, I'm going to, sorry, I know this is being recorded, but I have a model of Gale Crater up here at the front also. So if you'd like to take a look, come on up. This is very much um, vertically exaggerated. This is not um, how high everything looks if you were to go. Exaggerated by how much? You know, this is a new model, and I think it's about 10 times, but I have to actually find out. It wasn't written on the back. <laughs> so I didn't order it. This is from my coworker. But, um, but yes, so this is Gale Crater. And for those of you who maybe have not been as familiar with the mission, does anyone know what's weird about this crater? What's strange about that? Yeah. It was a lake at one point. Ah, OK. OK, so let's. That, that is true, we think that's true, but just from looking at it, Upwell, Upwelling in the middle. There's a big hill in the middle, a big mountain. Anyone know how tall that is? Higher than a thousand feet. What is it, Mount Everest? Uh, it's, it's three miles. Three miles tall. So this crater is about 150 kilometers in diameter, and it's got a five kilometer about um, mountain in the middle, and that's weird. Most impact craters do not have these mountains in the middle that look like that. And that is why we chose Gale Crater. It was selected because we do think at one time it may have been filled with water in a lake, and in that lake, Layers of sediment were laying down one on top of the other on top of the other and made this stratified sequence. So we've got layer upon layer upon layer upon layer that we think was laid down maybe in a lake environment. And these layers are like pages in the history book of Mars. So what Curiosity is going to do is it, is it landed over here. And it's going. To, it's it's been cruising around at the base of this mountain and finding some fantastic things, really fascinating stuff. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Um, but right now, it's in one of the neatest places, and it's going to be driving up that mountain and basically reading the history of what happened inside Gale Crater page by page as it goes up through these layers. So that is why Gale Crater was selected. A very exciting place. Um, so you can see where it landed. It's about um, on the, the equator. And here you can see, again, that, um, that mountain in the middle. And this is the, the landing ellipse. So that is where we knew Curiosity would land within you know, error um, from when we launched it in Cape Canaveral to where it landed. How precisely we landed, if you imagine launching from um, the East Coast from DC, and you could land on a specific seat in a, a stadium in, um, in California, which is what I was told, as a good way to picture just jumping 
being able to jump that far and land in that seat. So we landed almost smack dab in the center of that ellipse. And that's pretty good for an eight month cruise and not being able to control it. Once we were there, we just hit the button and said, please land, and it did. It was great. Um, we were all very thankful and kept our jobs. We appreciated that. <laughs> um, but it landed right in the middle of this fan. So we'll talk about that. That's a really, really interesting place to be. And here you can see some of those layers a little bit. Of course, that is artist conception, but that is the, the idea of where we wanted to go was because of that stack of sequences. All right. So how come we got to go to this place? So this place was selected by scientists, and that may sound strange, but that's important. This is the first time the science team had the final say about where we went when we landed a rover on Mars. Every other time, it's been the engineering team saying, all right, we want you to find the flattest, most boring place because we can get there safely. This time, the engineering team said, you know what? We got this. We can figure this out. They had some amazing people on this, uh, on this effort. And they said, OK, from the final four sites, you can pick any one of these, and we can do it. Um, they did give some initial constraints, so it was within a certain latitude band, and it was within a certain elevation um, constraint, but this is the science team got to select where they wanted to go. So that was really cool. And the reason for that is because of the sizes of the error, of the, the landing ellipse, of how certain they were of where they would actually land. We got to land in the bottom of a crater next to a mountain and by a crater ramp. That's really, really hard to do. <laughs> and they did. Um, so safe landing on August 6, 2012. How people were up to see it. All right, well, I'm proud of those of you who raised your hands. And if you didn't, have you seen the seven minutes of terror video? OK, if you haven't, you need to. It's awesome. It's so cool how they did this. I can't believe it. I've got a picture here of what they said, but I really, really wish I was in the meeting where the engineer said, hey, you know what we're going to do? We are going to slow down with this heat shield. And then once we get rid of the heat shield, we're going to have a parachute. All right, we're, we got the parachute. And then once we get rid of the parachute, we're going to have this jetpack. And that jetpack is going to guide us down to where we want to land. And then we're going to lower the rover on these nylon ropes. And then once the rover hits, we're going to cut the ropes. The jetpack's going to go fly off and land elsewhere. And you're going to be on the ground ready to go. What do you think? <laughs> I would have been like, no, you're kidding. And actually, I know scientists who were in the room, and they said, no, you're kidding. And the engineering team said, no, 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 this is really what we want to do. And they did. It was amazing. The models that they had to use um, to figure out what the atmosphere would be like, and what do you do if there's a dust storm, and what do you do if there's a windstorm, and what do you do, and what do you do, and what do you do? They figured this all out, and they were monitoring as best as they could um, you know, with the orbiters that were there to try to get the weather exactly right in their models for the time of year, and time of day, and time of everything that was going on. And this was the state of the art, um, and they did it. So amazing. So if you haven't seen the, the movie, and what I think also was my favorite part, is that once we got the message that said, hey, we're on Mars, well, we had landed seven minutes ago. <laughs> so this was a time delay because of where Mars is and when we get our data. So once we got the, hey, we're hitting the atmosphere, curiosity was on the ground. We just didn't know if it was in a crater or you know, on its, on its wheels, nice and safe. So I think that was really exciting. My husband and I were in Alaska at the time, desperately searching for internet so that we could find out, all right, come on, where's the signal? And we, we did get the signal at the time, but it was, it was really neat. Um, so, oh, I, I was looking at a different slide than you were. Sorry, I thought you saw that before. But yes, this is just the, the image of what was happening um, as it was going on. All right. 
So the other thing that I think was really cool about the landing was that high rise. Um, anyone heard of the high resolution imaging science experiment? All right, excellent. I used to work on that instrument at the uh, University of Arizona when I was a grad student. And it took a picture of Phoenix landing. Anyone seen that image? Phoenix mission that went to the northern hemisphere of Mars and scooped up some water, and, or water ice, and, and watched it sublimate. Well, Curiosity was the next one that it got on its way down to the ground. So this is such a cool camera. <coughs> if you went to Mars and you laid down on the ground and you made a Mars angel, it could see you. And I think that's pretty neat that um, we can see such detail. And this is the parachute um, on its way down. So I think that's pretty cool that an orbiter that had been there for six years and we haven't seen since then, you know, it's been doing well sending data, but it, it was able to send a picture just based on, you know, knowing the calculations of what we were planning to do and when we were planning to be there. So, pretty amazing engineering ones. All right, from here on forward, I have a lot of pretty pictures. So, we'll talk about what we've been doing on the ground, but I want to show you some, some neat things that we're, we're looking at. So, this was from um, the descent imager, taking a picture of the heat shield on the way down, and we're really studying um, what has happened to all these instruments so that we know for next time, what do we need to change, if anything, uh, to make sure that we, we land properly and are safe. So, here's us kicking up some dust just before we land. And then, here it is, our, our destination right from when we land, we pick our head up, and here's what we're looking at, and that mountain is Mount Sharp. That's the three-mile-high mountain in the middle. And this was named after a scientist who actually did a lot of work in Death Valley National Park. Um, and he was part of the mission, and unfortunately he passed away just a little bit before um, Curiosity went to Mars, and so they named this mountain in honor of Bob Sharp. I understand he was a great guy, I never had the pleasure to meet him, but that is why it got its name. <clears throat> All right, so then what did we do? So Bradbury Landing uh, is where we landed, and of course, when we get there, we want to check ourselves out. We want to take a picture of us to say, wow, we look great. <laughs> Really, because we want to make sure that all of our instruments are looking good. This is you know, not an easy thing to do to get to Mars. And then once we arrive, we want to know that we're safe before we start driving around, before we start unfolding everything, before we start using our instruments. We have to test and test and test. We've had several months of testing. As of February, we did our last first thing on Mars, um, our drilling, and I will tell you about that in just a little bit. But we have lots of testing to make sure we're okay before we move forward. So we have to take pictures of ourselves to make sure we look good. We also want to check our belly. Are we sitting on a rock? Did we land okay? Was something damaged? So we want to check that out too. So we often look underneath ourselves to find out how are we doing. And then this one I just have in because I think it's so <coughs> This is um, through a dust lens right when it landed, and this is Curiosity taking a picture of herself. Yes. All right, and yes, according to the whole science team, Curiosity is a she, so I will mention it as a she. <laughs> All right, so in here, when we landed, we have our shadow here, and now we're looking towards Mount Sharp. And once we have established our surroundings pretty well, we started doing some more science. And of course, images are science too. But we started using some of our other instruments. So ChemCam, that laser that we had on board, its first target on Mars was this triangular rock right here. And we found out that based on data it returned and from the APXS, the um, alpha ray particle spectrometer, I think I'm missing something in that. We never call it by its full name. <laughs> um, it, it is a basaltic material, very similar to some of the basalts we have here on Earth. And then we have some pictures of it to get a close-up view. So Curiosity's cameras have all kinds of ranges. So we can look really, 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 really close at fine mineral grain detail, and we can also look huge landscape view um, sizes. So it's an amazing um, suite of cameras that we have that are very capable of doing all kinds of imaging. So that's really 
been a nice thing. And then, where did we go? So we started driving. Now, Curiosity is a science-driven mission. We can go anywhere we want, and we can change our plans anytime we want. There is not a specific, you need to be here at this time. What we do have is a two-year primary science mission on Earth, a one-year mission on Mars. So, because Mars is farther out, it has a longer year. Um, so we know we have funding for that amount of time. Hopefully, we'll have funding until I retire. That would be great. Um, and, and hopefully, we'll have the capability to keep going. And with our, our fantastic uh, power source, we just may. Um, we'll have progressively less and less power. But if we just want to you know, keep that in mind as we're getting into our old age, we could still potentially keep going. So we started driving. And so we have this, this destination, of course, of Mount Shark. But on our way there, we want to test everything out, as I said. And we also want to do as much science as we can. And so some days we might drive more to get to some place cool. And some days we might just stay parked and analyze what we're, what we're seeing. So we headed off towards this destination that has three different types of units coming together. So we have these three different um, these, these places that look different from orbit, and we wanted to find out what was going on. So we headed towards the intersection of those. And as we're driving, Curiosity, which, um, or sorry, High Rise, which took the image of Curiosity, and High Rise is on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, forgot to mention that before, um, it is still taking pictures of where we are and where we're going, and we actually use images from High Rise to figure out where we're going to go next and what we want to see. And we've been really extensively looking at that and, and just checking in with where are we based on uh, our High Rise images. And then, many of you may have heard, or maybe not, and I get to tell you, very exciting, that we uh, saw a conglomerate in the landing site area. So I'm going to just show you a context image here. So these are the three places, and we're heading towards Glenelg, which is where the, the intersection of the units is. Um, and these three places are where we're going to look next. So Goldburn is where we landed. And actually, that black area, can everybody see that? So that's from where our jet thrusters um, swept away the dust. And that's why it has a different color. So that's why it looks different there. So right away, though, those thrusters that moved away the dust, they revealed the rock underneath. And so this is what we saw for the first time when we landed. We thought, oh, wow, we can see the bedrock. And it looked very interesting. And then we started driving, and we saw more interesting things. We saw a conglomerate um, with these rounded pebbles. Now, these rounded pebbles are very interesting to geologists. Anybody know why? Water. Yeah. They had to move. And could wind pick these things up? They're a centimeter or more in diameter? No. This had to be water. So we see these rounded pebbles, and they appear to have been transported by water. This is exciting. We thought we were going to find that, but we did not know from orbit what it would look like on the ground. And then we got to see this third outcrop called Hata. Um, and Hata reveals an ancient stream bed, we think. So we think we have actually found an ancient stream bed on Mars. And to give you some perspective on this, so this is um, where we landed, again, here's our ellipse, there's that little X that shows where we landed. And this alluvial fan is coming down. And anyone know what an alluvial fan is? All right, so we've got some folks who, Has anyone ever been to Death Valley or the desert southwest? You see in the mountains where it looks like these fans are coming down, they're spread down, and they've got lots of rocks. Well, they are formed when water rushes down the side. They're normally formed um, when there's a period of a lot, a lot, a lot of water rain likely coming down and pushing a lot of sediment all at once. And then it's normally followed by a dry period. And it's sort of an incremental um, of movement of the sediment down. And it can create these fans. And so one of those fans that looks like a 
a little bit like a delta, and it has that same shape, um, is right next to our landing lips, and we think we have some of the channels that came off of that fan right near where we landed. So really cool to find that. All right, then I'm gonna talk a little bit about our scooping. So we went to this place called Rock Nest, and Rock Nest is um, this area up here, and we looked at some of the wind-blown material there. So let me show you what we did. So we wanted to check out what this material was. So the reason we actually went to a dune was because, as I said, we, we wanted to test everything out. We also wanted to clean ourselves out. So when we went to Mars, we want to look for stuff on Mars, right? Sounds good? So we don't want to look for the stuff we brought with us from Earth. So in order to make sure that when we analyze a, a powder or a sample, that we're studying what's on Mars and not just the stuff that was left over from launch, we have to clean ourselves out. So we wanted to find a really fine grain material that had about the same size particles. So we went to a, a, a little ripple here, and then we had to make sure it was fine grain, so we scooped up. Yes, do you have a question? Is that outside the blast area then? Yes, we are well outside the blast area. Yes, thank you, good and, question. Uh, you've been using the term conglomerate. Is that different from an aggregate that I'm familiar with? A conglomerate is uh, rounded pebbles that are glued together um, with some sort of uh, matrix is what we call it, but it's it's just basically rounded pebbles glued together. And I, I, an aggregate, um, I'm not sure of the geologic term for aggregate. It's usually sedimentary. But, uh... Okay. Um, so it, it might be similar, but conglomerate implies rounded pebbles. Um, a breccia is another term that's often used with a conglomerate, and that is uh, the same type of thing, but not rounded pebbles. So that has very um, angular components inside of breccia, whereas a conglomerate is more rounded. So a conglomerate is more often associated with water transport, and breccia might be a rock fall or something, a rock slide. Um, but good question, and if anyone else has a better a better understanding of how they compare, please jump on in. Um, but yeah, so we went over to this, uh, this area to scoop, and what we did was we filled up our scoop, and then we sent it through our sample handling system to clean out all of the earth material in there. So that was the first step of what we wanted to do. Um, but I just thought it was pretty neat that we, we wanted to figure out what was there, so we drive on and we back up. I think that's just kind of cool science. I don't know. Way to, way to use the materials you've got. All right, and so here's a close-up view. So here are some of our scoops, and here is that first um, picture of our sample, and this was, all of our science team was so proud of this picture, I should have made it big. Um, but here's a close-up of what we see, and we actually saw sorting there. So there was actually um, uh, bigger uh, materials, so not big rocks, but, but larger grains on top that were sort of shielding finer grained material underneath. So we think that that means there was a big windstorm that uh, was able to transport larger materials and then over time um, there's just been a little bit of sorting and so we have this armoring. You might find armoring also in the desert some places, um, just the bigger materials on the surface and then what's underneath is protected and it doesn't go away. All right, so then we started to look at some of the samples from Rock Nest. And we also found some basaltic grains there, and then some evidence for water, for sulfates, for carbonates, for um, even perchlorate. So this is um, from SAM, the Sample Analysis at Mars Instrument Suite, and it shows you how, or it shows you the components of what we're seeing inside uh, that sample. And the way that this happens is it, it heats up the samples like a big oven. And Sam sniffs the atmosphere and tastes the soil. And the way it does it, it's like a big nose. So if you were to have a cup of hot chocolate and you had it in the fridge for a long time, you, you made a hot chocolate cup, and I don't know why you'd stick it in the fridge, but let's say you did. You had one in the fridge and then you made a new one. And then you smelled both of them. You have a cold one and a hot one. Which smells better? The hot one. Well, you can get more information from the hot one. So we heat up our samples 
to release those vapors so we can figure out what is made or what those materials that we're, we're looking at are made of. So sand is like a big nose and it is an oven to heat up uh, the materials also. It also has these juice packs it brought with it, um, which are the low temperature experiments. Um, so it can conduct chemistry without heating up the sample quite as high. So we've got two different types. Um, and we also have a Kemmin instrument. Kemmin is a complementary instrument to SAM. And Kemmin looks at the mineral grains and finds out what the minerals are made of. And SAM is more of the organic molecules component. And really, all of Curiosity is about using all of the different instruments together. So it's a very integrated mission. It cannot do alone. Um, no instrument can do alone what all of them can do together. And that is one of the powers of, of this mission. Um, all right, and this is just another pretty picture, too, because Curiosity, I think, is pretty beautiful. And it shows all of our, our uh, scoops and our treads. And it can take these great pictures so action. All right, so Mars measuring the, the atmosphere and environment. So I just will talk about these kind of quickly. But we have a weather station with us. We want to know what it's like in Gale Crater. So we have been testing over, actually, every day, all the time, um, we are testing the environment there. You can get a daily weather report on Mars. So if you want to know what it's going to be like each day, you can check the Curiosity website. We have found that there's about 170 degree difference between night and day in Gale Crater. Kind of amazing. You got to really pack in layers if you go. <laughs> um, and we also have found out, you know, how, how does the air and the, the ground, how do they interact and what are their temperatures like throughout the day? And we're finding some pretty cool stuff um, just from, actually, this is it really into the pressure sensor. But so we can detect local phenomena and global phenomena. So the weather changes based on the seasons on Mars as well. And we're actually detecting the sublimation of the south polar cap um, using our pressure sensor, which is kind of neat. We're also noticing this pressure wave come through every day um, as the sun rises and sets um, over Gale Crater. So really, really cool. All right. I mentioned that we have the radiation detector. And this had started on our way to Mars and is still working there. And we're trying to figure out what would your radiation dose be had you been at Gale Crater. And actually, we um, should be getting some interesting data back from this just recently. Um, in the past week, we have had a solar storm. And um, we were kind of nervous on the science team. What do we do? Do we shut down? What do we, like, how do we protect ourselves? And it ended up not being. Um, as big of a storm as we thought, but we use uh, the Solar Dynamics Observatory and other observatories by the sun to figure out what's the weather on the sun like right now and how is that going to affect curiosity. So we're detecting what the, the radiation environment is like there, but we're also paying attention to the other instruments that are working elsewhere in the solar system to figure out how do we prepare ourselves in case there is a big storm, we can protect ourselves if we need to. We haven't had to yet, but we, we are able to do that. All right, we also have Dan. I like all the ones with fun names. Um, and Dan is a neutron detector from Russia, and it is looking for uh, water beneath the rover. So it sends neutrons down into the soil, and then based on the speed, which, which, uh, which, which, they, no, I don't think I said that right either. So based on their speed, when they return back, um, to the sensor, we can figure out whether or not there is hydrogen below the rover. And hydrogen is often paired you know, with water. So we are looking to find out whether there is water maybe tied up in the minerals, or maybe you know, as um, even an ice deposit, it's looking in the meter below the surface. So we are, we are keeping track of that as we drive along. All right, we're also measuring the gases in the atmosphere. And we have detected that argon is actually the second most um, popular, get popular, um, abundant gas is probably more than popular. I don't really go with popularity uh, in atmospheric com composition, but that's okay. So carbon dioxide is the most abundant um, gas in the atmosphere, but argon has just edged out nitrogen, um, and nitrogen had been the second most um, abundant, according to Viking. But the SAM team is, is very certain that they have a better um, detector, and, and they have re 
rewriting the books on the Martian atmosphere components. Um, there was also some, anyone heard about the controversy over methane in the Mars atmosphere? No? Okay, well, we do not see it. So in case you did hear the story about the, the press release, um, we thought we found it, but guess what? We found Florida methane. So again, how we're trying to clean out the instruments and get rid of all of the other components um, that might have come from Earth. Well, there was gas in Curiosity that we brought with us to Mars. And so when we first ran SAM, we found a whole lot of methane. And we thought, oh my gosh, we did not expect that. And then headquarters said, OK, press release. And we arranged it, and we made a date for it. And then the science team said, you know what? We really don't trust this. We're going to do it again. And they tested it again. And they got a, a much smaller methane component, but it was still there. And then they opened up all the inlets, the vents. They cleared everything out. And then they tested it again. And nothing there. Nothing, at least, that we can detect within our limits. So there was a huge press release on the methane on Mars. And we just thought it was pretty funny that the, the folks doing the press release were probably like, well, why did you, why did you schedule this press release to say, nope, there's nothing there? <laughs> but the reason was we thought there might have been. And then we just had to test again. That's why you have to have multiple measurements and confirm what you see before you say we're going to announce something. And that is something um, all scientists know, but headquarters doesn't always. And yes, they did wait for us to make some more measurements before we moved on. All right, so where are we now? So we are. We have driven some more, so you can tell here's a 300 meter scale. And then we have driven from Bradbury Landing all along here. And you can tell that we have been moseying around and going places wherever. Ooh, that looks kind of neat. Let's go over there. Ooh, that looks kind of neat. Let's go over there. And we're supposed to. And that's part of the mission. We are driven by the science on the way. Um, and as we're driving around, we are getting some dings. I don't know if you can tell on our wheels here, but we are getting some dings. This is good, though. This means we're going places. So we are very excited about our dings. Does anyone know the cool story about the holes on the rover wheels? <laughs> yes. Yes, JPL is very proud of their contributions to planetary science. And they, they are well deserving of their, of their proud um, Proudness, again, not a good word. Um, but they did originally have JPL on the wheels, and NASA said, no, you can't do that. And so they put it in Morse code. <laughs> so as Curiosity drives around, JPL, 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 JPL. But it is in Morse code, so you have to be able to understand Morse code to know that. But in case you didn't tell, couldn't tell, that's what it says. All right, so we're also looking at some more rock layers here. And these layers that we're finding, the shaler rocks, also indicate that the, the rocks were transported um, before they were laying down. And we have some really, really cool stuff here. This is one of the neatest places we could possibly have tested out some of our instruments. So you can see these veins that are moving along here. and. We have lots of fractures, and they're filled with all kinds of things. They're showing really, actually, a history of water here that we had not fully anticipated when we first went. For example, we can see these veins that are filled with these calcium sulfate minerals um, that appear to have precipitated out of solution. So we think there was water flowing through these rocks, and they deposited these calcium sul um, sulfate veins within the rocks, within cracks in the rocks. That's really neat. That's an episode of water interacting with the rocks. Has anyone heard of the Martian blueberries? All right, good. We've got some Martian blueberry folks in the room. Excellent. Well, we have similar things in the Gale Crater area. So we have these spherules, they're little balls, that also suggest interaction with water that made these um, these balls precipitate out of the rocks, and, and or they were deposited by water within the rocks. If you want to hear more about that, we can talk about that later. But pretty, pretty neat that suggests, again, water moving through the rocks. So we have water depositing the rocks and then potentially interacting with the rocks once they were already there. So really, really neat. And again, since we think that Gale may have been a lake, we would expect that there was a lot of water there. But the story that we're reading is just richer than anyone could tell from orbit since we're on the ground. 
Also, I wanted to show you some of the cool stuff we're doing. So this one's pretty neat. We have um, these metal, uh, they're, I don't really know how you, you call them, but they're little metal strings almost. And you can whirl them around really fast and clear off the rocks. And then this is how we can see what's underneath the dust layer. And what's kind of exciting is what do you notice about this patch as compared to over here? It's cleaner. It's, it's a different color, right? This is big news, folks. We like to see a different color. What does the red mean on Mars? What about iron? Mars is rusted, right? And evidence of organic molecules that could have maybe um, been built by life, been supported by life, it does not do well in an environment where we have lots of rust. But right underneath the surface, we're seeing a different color, meaning that maybe we're finding materials that have not been influenced by this so far. We have some members of the science team that are trying to figure out why we have these different colors. We don't know fully yet, but it could be that maybe this was unearthed recently, and that's why it hasn't been completely damaged by radiation yet, and we have maybe evidence of, or we can find um, materials not too far below the surface that may have been more like they were when they were originally laying down and not destroyed by radiation yet. So this is, you know, no results that speak of this yet, but just the color suggests that something is different underneath the surface, and that is exciting. All right, and now we're drilling. So I'm just gonna tell you quickly, this is the coolest thing. This just happened recently. Um, so this is our, our press release from February 20th, talked all about the drilling on Mars. They had hoped to do this before Valentine's Day, and on February 8th, this happened. Um, so to set the scene here, I know this is kind of not a very good image over here, but we are heading towards this area over here. John Klein is another member of the Curiosity team uh, that unfortunately passed away um, just recently, but he and his wife and his son all work at JPL and have been very involved in the mission. John Klein was a deputy project scientist for four years, um, 2005 to 2009, I believe, and so they named um, the drilling site in his honor. His son um, helped contribute to the drill. Um, so we wanted to find out what we were looking at before we actually drilled into it. So here are some of the, the places that we did some tests. Um, so we, we um, I think it was in Wernicke where we did the, the clearing off of the surface that I just showed you before. Um, we also tested it with ChemCam the composition of the rocks at that site. We also tested out our um, our percussive component of the drill at um, Thunder Cloud, I think it was. And so we've been testing in all of these different areas. And that yellow dot, that's where we actually drilled. All right. So here's what the drill looks like from the back. So here it is right there. And these two components on the sides are the stabilizers. So they stay on the rocks next to it. And then when the rock, um, when the drill goes down and it also percusses as it goes down, that stabilizes um, the, the arm, actually. So this, this arm right here, it weighs about 200 pounds. And it's seven feet long. So you have to move it very, very gently. It's sort of like deadlifting a lawnmower and very gently trying to move it within a few centimeters. So actually, you moving it within a few centimeters. Here we want to actually hit each of those um, targets dead on. So very, very nice maneuvering of that, of that arm. All right, and here we have the drill in position. And then here we go, the first drill um, of a, a rock on Mars. We have never, ever drilled before on Mars. We have used different types of tools to um, clear off the surface before, but we have never actually drilled down. And of course, our, our big drill, anyone want to take a guess how deep we went? One. All right, I think I've heard it's about two and a half inches. But we are so proud. <laughs> All right, this is big news. Nobody has ever drilled below the surface, and we have gone two and a half inches below the surface. Yeah, 
This is great. We are really excited. Um, and we had to do a lot of testing in order to get to this point. Um, again, all of those sites, we had all the different types of materials um, that were tested and checked, and what's this made of, and what's the hardness of this, and what's going on. Um, here was over here we drilled first, um, and that only went down about a centimeter, just to make sure we knew what the material was, we knew how to um, operate the drill, everything was going well, and the drill actually sucks up the sample into the drill. I should have shown a picture, we have 1,200 test drill holes from JPL. Before we sent this up, we have 1,200 holes that we drilled to make sure we knew what we were doing. So after that, the team said, okay, we think we got it. And again, we have the sample that went into the scoop and we just ingested it last week. So this was very, very new, very recent, very exciting. And again, a different color. So we are very excited to be testing the new, not um, red color. Yes, did you have a question? Yeah, what's the particle size that you're aiming for there? Excellent. So we actually aim for you know a, a small particle size, but then we sieve it to 150 microns. So the human hair is about 100 microns in width, and we go just a little bit bigger than that, and that is what um, gets through to our, our tube. And actually, I can show you that. I'm sorry, this is kind of technical, but here we have that sift. So we, we take the sample into the drill, and it goes up here, and then it's pumped through. So the sample actually enters up through the drill, and then it goes to this sieve. And actually, if you go onto the website, you can watch all these crazy motions that the, the whole head of the arm makes um, as it's trying to get the sample into all these different places. And this is the sieve, so it goes to a 150 micron sieve, and then it goes out here and into um, these two holes right here. So these are the sample inlet um, holes, and they, they send samples into SAM and Kenan for analysis. All right, and just to keep an eye on the prize here, folks, we're going to Mount Sharp. That's where we're heading. So um, here is the base. We landed over here, and we're now at Glen Elm, so you can tell how far we went. And that was since August, but we, we did have a lot of testing, and we're, we're, we're taking things slow. We're being safe, because not many people are able to go fix things if something goes wrong. So we want to be safe, um, but we are heading over here Ultimately, that's the goal. And just to show you some pretty pictures, because it's so pretty. And what's amazing to me is how much this looks like the desert, desert southwest. You can almost see someone on one of these mountains with their cell phone looking for a signal. <laughs> but they're not there, not yet. We haven't found them. But this is where we're heading. And just so you know, this boulder right here is the size of curiosity. That's how big it is in comparison to where we're going. Um, and I, I did want to just end with a few things. Again, that press conference is on Tuesday. So if you want to hear more about the drilling and the sample that has been um, collected and what we're finding from that, check out uh, the Curiosity website. And that's right up on here. Also, the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference, if you're not familiar with that, it is a big conference in Houston coming up in two weeks. Actually, no, I think it's next week. It is next week. So I gotta get my poster ready. <laughs> Woo. Um, so yes, it's coming up and it will have lots of press conferences related to Curiosity. There will be lots of science talks. There will be a lot of this broadcast publicly if you're interested. The abstracts are already posted if you want to read up on anything. There I think I think there might be 200 papers submitted to this, and there are also papers coming out in science um, and nature and, and all kinds of other journals soon. Um, so keep an eye out. But Lots of exciting things, and I do encourage you to go to the Curiosity website. There is a, a rover update every week. Um, that's just a video that's only you know a, a minute or two long, um, but lots of great ways to find out what's happening with this mission. Yes. Is the computer working again? So they have shifted over. There was. Um, um, a memory error last week with the rover, and they have shifted over to the B side of the computer. And this is good news because, again, we have lots of redundancy built into this mission just in case things like this happen. Um, we have not determined exactly what the cause of the problem was from what caused the error, but the, the rover did save. It is now out of safe mode, um, and it is using side B, and it is trying to figure out what happened on the A side, but that has not yet been determined. But we are, we are doing okay. Um, 
but yes, good way to be concerned with our health. We appreciate that. <laughs> Is there a thought that it might be re repairable? You know, I'm not sure if they have determined that yet. Um, I, I, I don't know. Was that part of the design that they might be able to repair something much of what went wrong with that, or is that just curiosity that they might be able to figure out what went wrong and prevent the future? No, I think they're going to try to see if they can if they can get it working. It seems like at this point they know it should be available as a backup still. Um, but what they're doing right now is actually kind of interesting. So the B side doesn't know what has happened all the time since we landed. So right now they're telling the B side where the arm is and where everything's positioned so it can know how to pick up from here. Um, but yes, they do have it it's still working in the background. Um, but I think they'll try to repair it if they can. So I, I don't know exactly, because I'm not familiar with exactly details of that, but there is a memory error. They can, and they can detect memory each error. memory. They can replan the computer to bypass the section of memory and just Yeah, it's all right. Right. But I don't know for sure. Yeah, I, again, this is still sort of in the preliminary times, but we are recovering. And, and yes, I think they will try to repair or at least block off which section they shouldn't use. Well, we could have been also. Um, the uh, cosmic rays just happening a bit and the memory is fine, just, you know, we the error that it's just a record. We enable everything, it works just fine. I don't know. Actually, I noticed that the radiation measurements were arbitrary units. Is there anything with, does that correspond to Rankin's or uh, other measurements of radiation? Um, a good question. So, um, they, I am not as familiar with the radiation detector. I will just say that right away. But um, I think that they may have to, well, obviously they'll have to correlate that with something that everyone can interpret what this means. And I, I don't know the progress on that yet. But yes, a good observation. <laughs> and I intend to go to that LPSC talk to find out more about that. But yes, good if anybody knows, let yell it out, because I'm not as familiar with that one. Yeah? Um, what was the, what was the, um, sorry. What was the projected speed for Curiosity to be uh, going? How, how fast it can go? Well, it is going pretty slow. <laughs> so part of that is, I can't remember. Because I think it's like, ah. Uh, it is this right? So why, yeah. are you, why are you worried about that? I can't remember the exact speed if someone remembers it, but it is. It is slow. And the reason it is slow is because we really don't want to hit anything. Um, but we also have some um, features built in to make sure we don't hit anything. So we have many cameras all over the place, for one. And we also have um, a laser that shoots out in front of us and makes sure that if it shoots out and does not come back within the amount of time it should, so it knows, OK, if in a second I don't hear back, then maybe I'm over a cliff or facing a cliff. And so I'm going to stop and say, hey, I'm not going anywhere. You take a look at this and let me know if I should keep going. So I can't remember the speed, but but it's something that you might not be very impressed by. <laughs> yes, yes. And again, we are not even trying to go fast. Um, but it is kind of cool, like talking to the rover um, operators, it's like, the coolest video game ever. You get to drive a rover on Mars using, again, these cameras um, from orbit and also in front of you. Um, but they, they are very careful because they know that their little robot does not come back to life if you knock it over a rock three times. It, so. is, it is a 15 minute uh, response time. <laughs> yeah, it depends on where um, Mars is in its orbit and where Earth is in its orbit. Um, so we are coming up on. Um, a, a time when Mars will be behind the sun in relation to the Earth. So we are trying to make as many plans as we can. So Curiosity is getting a list of things to do while we can't communicate with it. Um, but yes, it is a, a, a delay time that you don't want the rover to have too much power <laughs> to get in trouble. Uh, do you know if they spend a lot of time developing the autonomy behavior for that uh, gap of control? Yes, they certainly make sure that Curiosity will still be working. Um, they have to keep in mind 
projects that it can do without getting hurt, and also projects um, it can do without filling up the memory. Um, because we want to always, of course, maintain the weather and um, pressure and sensor and all of those things that can go all the time. We want to have enough memory to keep doing those. Of course, a lot of those don't take very much memory, truly. Um, but we want to keep doing things to keep us busy the whole time, but not fill up the memory so that we just hang out after a while. But yes, they definitely want to take advantage of all the time we have. Since it's only a two-year mission, we are not waiting a month to do the next experiment. Did you have a question? Yes. And so most of the atmosphere is uh, carbon dioxide. Is there any theory that uh, where the carbon dioxide has come to the atmosphere? Uh, we think most of it's from volcanic outgassing. Just like on Earth, most of our atmosphere is from volcanic outgassing. Same with Mars. And actually, I didn't mention it, um, but you may have heard of MAVEN, the Mars Atmosphere and Volatile Environment Explorer. It is going to launch from Cape Canaveral in November, and it will be helping study the atmosphere of Mars. So this will be an orbiter, and it's got this fantastically crazy orbit that allows it to swoop in really close to the planet and go out really far and, and really cover the space around Mars in a, a very nice way. Um, and it's going to try to figure out what has happened to the atmosphere of Mars. So we think at one time Mars was warmer and wetter and had a thicker atmosphere, but we don't know where it went. Um, we, we think it was there based on the evidence we see on the surface, and we know it's gone based on our present observations. So we are going to try to figure out what the, the composition and the state of the atmosphere is today, and also figure out the rate of atmospheric loss so that we can model how it may have been at some time in the past. Um, so it's going to be coordinating these uh, measurements with Curiosity, so Curiosity can be facing up and detecting what's going on, and uh, Maven can be looking down, and together we should get a better picture of the Mars atmosphere than we've had before. I think we have time for one more question, and then we can uh, uh, talk informally for as long as Andrea has time for it. But, uh, All right. All right. Yes. Um, where's Curiosity right now? It is in Gale Crater at the base of Mount Sharp, or actually not even at the base of Mount Sharp, but it is near the base of Mount Sharp right now. And maybe I'll take one more. We are not planning to put a plant on Mars. Actually, we were really, really, really careful when we went to Mars to scrub off as much of the, the cells and all of the, the skin that the engineers were shedding all over that rover, um, we wanted to get rid of as much of that as we could because we still don't know whether there could be life on Mars, either at some time in the past or maybe even today. So if we go and find life, if we find, we're looking again for tiny little molecules, or not molecules, tiny little microorganisms that we couldn't even maybe see with our eyes, really, really tiny. But if we find those, we want to know if they're Martian or if they're from Earth. So if we bring life with us and then we find it, we don't know if we found what we brought with us or if we found something that was there to begin with. So we really want to figure out that question before we try to bring anything with us. <laughs> But so but on it, uh, there's more life on Earth under the surface of the Earth than on top of the surface of the Earth. I mean, the same thing could happen on Mars, that there could be still life under the surface that we haven't captured yet. Yeah, so we, we're trying to be very careful at this point and, and be very careful you know, that we document everything that we can that we're bringing there. So in case we find life and in case we find out that our spacecrafts are harmful, we can try to maybe get them out of there. <laughs> And the burning question, the burning question with pedal to the metal at full speed ahead, curiosity gets about 27 and a half feet per hour. All right! <laughs> Nine days to cover a mile. Well, thank you very much. It's essentially a DC commute in the morning. <laughs> you can think about your drive tomorrow morning. Thank you very much.
Um, and then some other goodies up here. So come on up if you'd like.